Hi everyone, welcome to the Greg Chapman Show. Uh, this is a show mainly meant for facilitators and trainers conducting workshops virtually or face-to-face -face on any kind of behavioral topic ranging from leadership to self-awareness to high-performing teams and so forth. The idea of this long-form conversation is to help fellow trainers and facilitators learn techniques, change mindsets, or even bust many of the facilitation myths out there. Uh, tips and tricks also find their way in here, and all of this from masters of their craft from across the world. If you're starting out, or if you're a veteran facilitator, you'll find something in here for yourself. Today's guest is Jawad Ahmed, and so a little bit about Jawad. Many moons ago, Jawad started his career in sales, but quickly did a left turn, realized his passion was in people development. And, you know, for the last 15 odd years, he's been working with organizations on business strategy, on cultural transformation, performance management, and has headed the training divisions at reputed consulting firms. Uh, he has presented at the International Association of Facilitators and SIETAR conferences in India. He is also the co-chair in the committee of the International Association of Facilitators in India. He is currently among the few certified trust building practitioners in India and a certified Kirkpatrick Four Levels Evaluation Facilitator. Dwad is at present the Director for OD Solutions and C2C Organizational Development Private Limited. Welcome to the show, Dwad. Welcome, happy to be here. So you've been facilitating for a while and I just thought by, we'd start off by turning the table a little bit. Now, when, and we want to come at this saying, when have, you, you know, think of it when you were on the other side of the table, when you were not facilitating, but being a, a participant, when were you a participant? And you learned something in a workshop that really transformed your life, all right? And so a little bit about what was that and what went into the transformation? Uh, you know, was it a great facilitator? And then, you know, so what was, uh, what made that so good? Or was it just because you were at a certain uh, point of time in your life? So a bunch of questions going down there and I'll let you take it whichever way you want to. Yeah, surely. I'll, I'll probably start uh, with um, where my aha was mm -hmm. and then maybe add a little bit more so that uh, I, I think the listeners and the viewers can also get an idea of uh, what perhaps from a background actually kind of came together for me. So what really happened was I, I spent about two years managing a learning academy in, uh, in Qatar, in Doha. Um, I came back to India mm -hmm. and um, I, I thought, let me get myself into a formal uh, training about how to be a trainer. Uh, and that's really when I actually attended uh, a, a program uh, by a gentleman, um, called uh, Lee Milstein. Now, Lee Milstein uh, at that point was uh, the international representative for the International Association of Facilitators, but he represented uh, Thailand, mm -hmm. but he was an American gentleman and he was really huge. Mm -hmm. And um, three days of a program and we, the first day I go in and I'm really eager like a lot of people to learn something and, and take it back there and see how I can use it maybe in the programs I do. Um, and what I realized uh, was that at the end of the day, uh, I had realized that Lee was actually sitting on a chair throughout the day, mm -hmm. had not moved uh, except for lunch maybe and, and some breaks. Um, and uh, I was wondering what I had actually learned. Um, so we didn't have a PowerPoint slide. There wasn't like a slide deck that we were actually using. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of material. There was a lot of handouts and so on. Um, so... I was, I was reflecting at the end of the day and I saw that um, I had actually learned quite a lot. But the funny thing was that I'd learned a lot by actually having interactions with my fellow participants. All of them, um, some of them came with maybe what, just a year's experience and they were as senior as maybe about 20 years in the teaching field. 
right? Um, so it was a good group to actually learn from. And what I realized in my aha was that um, Lee had actually got us to share our experiences and knowledge with each other. Mm-hmm. So essentially, um, he had raised the group wisdom uh, to be able to help each other. Mm-hmm. And it was mostly conversational the whole day. So my paradigm of learning from the trainer or learning from the person who's supposed to be an expert completely shifted that day. Okay. Um, I learned that, uh, yes, you can actually learn from um, an intelligent uh, and uh, an experienced group of people too. And that's the first time I actually um, experienced facilitation and not training. Um, in my definition, training is knowledge transfer. And uh, facilitation is where we uh, bring the group's wisdom to be able to kind of help each other, solve issues, um, look at opportunities, and work on ideas, etc. What did Lee, Lee Milstein, right? That's what you said, Lee Milstein. Yeah, Lee Milstein. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I was just repeating it for our viewers if they want to Google up. Um, yeah. So I'm sure this is a very long time back. And, but if you can remember, you know, what did Lee do? Um, any one best practice or anything that, you know, s- sticks in your mind um, to, uh, you know, lean on, bring out the group wisdom, as you called it. Yeah, so I think it all started uh, with the way uh, he had kind of designed the whole uh, conversation. So there was relevant input about uh, knowledge about the topic areas that we're talking about, but that came in more as to reinforce a learning that we had. So it would normally be that, you know, Lee would normally lead with uh, a conversation on experiences that people may have had in the room or a discussion around something uh, like a case or, or an issue that we may have had. And in the conversation, as you're brainstorming, we're talking to each other, sharing each other's experiences and learning from each other, he would bring in the conceptual pieces. So whether it was a framework, whether it was something that could uh, help you debrief better, if it was something that you could, you needed to know about conflict uh, in the room better, Whatever the conversation, the topic was, he would kind of bring it in as a, a theoretical construct, post maybe a conversation of an in exchange of ideas and experiences. So that was a good reinforcement. And then the following conversation after that would be: so how does this apply in your um, in your own context? Can you can we think about that? And so it later became more an application, more focused in my own environment, right? and which is likely to be different from. Uh, each other's, the group that was there. But we ended up actually helping each other, challenging, asking questions. And that kind of brought a lot more engagement uh, in the room. Um, I felt that, you know, I was contributing equally, although I I was maybe far lesser in experience with the rest of the folks uh, who were there. But that's the beauty of, um, of the way Lee facilitated that whole conversation. So uh, that kind of stuck. And, and that's, um, that's one way that I have found a lot of conversations I have made engaging by doing exactly what I learned from Lee uh, those many years back. So what I'm taking away is you, he did not just introduce a construct. He warmed people up to a concept uh, by way of a narrative or a story or an incident and then weaving the framework, the relevant framework into the narrative and getting people to then take that narrative, take that framework and then do something with it, like practice and stuff. And so so three easy steps to, um, you know, facilitation. Yeah, I'm oversimplifying that a little bit, but I'm saying broadly, if somebody wanted to go deeper into this rabbit hole, we're saying you could get into uh, first warming people up and then, and then, gradually sharing the actual meat and potatoes of... Uh, yeah, that, that usually works better from an engagement perspective. And um, typically for, uh, and if I may just kind of add to that a little bit, uh, just for maybe um, listeners and viewers who may be thinking that what about groups who may have absolutely zero experience, mm. right? Because that's a logical uh, thought that may come in. Um, what I have uh, seen later as I, I worked and applied more of the facilitation methods 
is that um, we use a specific method or a methodology or a technique called Textra. Um, now Textra, Textra is, right? Textra. Okay. Textra is usually um, as a as a technique uh, in uh, process facilitation is more meant to bring the entire group to a common level of understanding around any topic you want. So say for example, let's take a topic uh, we may have no clue about, right? Um, so say we, we've heard uh, Elon Musk has spoken about neural networks, you know, which um, means having some kind of a bionic chip in your mind and you do all the transfers of knowledge directly, correct? Now we have no clue. I mean, let's say the group has no idea about it. Uh, what Textra does is to pick maybe about five or six articles around that same topic, right? Which we know that is good for the group to kind of understand neural networks and um, give smaller groups. So let's say if I have 30 people, I would maybe split them into five uh, groups of five people each, give them all the same article, right? But each article is color coded with a different color. Okay. Now, uh, the instructions are go away uh, in the room, um, catch hold of anybody who has a different article than yours. Initially, there is some time given for them to read the article and capture maybe some golden nuggets that they feel are relevant. And then you go ahead, find someone with a different article, different color code, and go and exchange those golden nuggets with each other. Right? And if you give them about 10 to 15 minutes or 10 to 12 minutes on this, what happens is you will have a group that will come back to you before the debrief who is almost similar in terms of their understanding. So they may have had an article that they read, but they get the essence of all the other articles yeah. too. So it's a quick way to get the group together. Now, we've used this with Alliance Francais. Um, the teachers there have used it with students who are learning about France and French and culture, et cetera. And tremendous success because um, the engagement that people bring in to the stories, to the to the experiences that they may have had with friends who were there. Um, so it's not just telling people about something that they just learned, but it is more about how can I make that mine when you're actually sharing it, right? And so that happens naturally. So there is um, a lot of engagement and learning for even people who may have zero knowledge about a subject or a topic. That's, that's a good value add, and I'm sure listeners of this are going to go and Google this T E X T R A, right? Textra. That's, that's, good. that's, you know, utilizing technology and learning. And I'm also seeing that it's very easily, therefore, adaptable to the online space as well. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, I'm constantly, and a lot of clients are constantly asking me, so, hey, you know, what, what are the tools can we yeah, use yeah. for the online space? And I'm just saying we can very easily bung this yeah. in uh, to that. So that kind of a space. All right, um, uh, Jawad, you, I remember you saying something like, what does get in the center of a network mean to you? Well, that's an interesting story actually. And, and this also happened uh, quite some time back. And this, was, this actually started with my realization that um, you know, I, I needed to build networks, mm -hmm. especially if I had to be relevant uh, in, in the industry that I was in, which is consulting, facilitation, working with people, et cetera. So I started looking at uh, what kind of organizations uh, were there uh, at that particular point. And this is the time I'm saying this is 2008, maybe uh, seven or eight, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, when you didn't have a Facebook, you didn't have uh, uh, some of the other mechanisms of uh, networking that, were, that are available today for people. Um, so uh, we had a, a network, an online network called eAcademy okay. uh, at that point. Now eAcademy uh, was a subscription-based network just like how LinkedIn is today. But uh, the philosophy of eAcademy was that if you paid for being part of a network, then you'd be serious about networking, mm. right? And if it was free, uh, like LinkedIners, maybe you will not be as serious to network with people. So that was the philosophy at that particular point. Um, and so I decided that um, let me see how I can use this network. And I and I came across uh, information that there's a gentleman called um, Akhil Shahani. Um, so he is uh, part of the Shahani group of companies. Mm -hmm. um, a phenomenal gentleman, um, been on the Times cover. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he was someone who was managing the India E Academy network at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote to him saying that I was interested in being part of this network and if I could meet up with him. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, this was a New Year's uh, day. Uh, we were catching up on the 31st of December. I happened to be in Mumbai at that time. 
and uh, he's based out of Mumbai. Uh, so he said, surely, why don't we catch up in the first half of the day? And I met up with him. And I think probably the most useful advice I've taken away from him in that conversation I've had mm -hmm. was that when he told me that if you really want to be visible to people, then you have to be at the center of a network. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, that got me thinking because you can be part of networks for sure. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us are part of associations, a lot of us are part of networks, all of that. But until you, you are actually in a spot which makes you more visible, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it becomes challenging for you to still be able to kind of utilize or, or uh, benefit from the, the power of what the network brings to you. And that is something which uh, I learned that day and I actively started looking out uh, for other networks which I could be uh, part of. Um, around that time, uh, the International Association of Facilitators, which I was a member of at that point, uh, wrote uh, to all its members in India asking if anybody wanted to take up the representation for India as the current representative had uh, quit. Um, so there was my opportunity. I had I was fresh from my meeting uh, with uh, Akhil and I said, I'm ready. I, I had no clue what it would mean uh, to actually be part of uh, being representative uh, of India to the International Association of Facilitators. But I just put up my hand and that journey has been phenomenal. Uh, I think uh, both the associations as well as me, uh, we've, we've had a great relationship where I've given as much as I have received. Uh, and that's been, a, you know, been really beneficial across my career. And I wanted to leverage this because you've also set up your own organization. You've grown it. Uh, you, you, you've learned about networking, probably that sales muscle uh, somewhere also helping you. So, and you know, I, and that was just to put that in context for our listeners or viewers. Um, you, you know, a lot of times I see facilitators uh, become very good at their core, um, core training, their core expertise and view splashing themselves to the world or view marketing themselves as something that they're not very comfortable with. Uh, I've gone through that myself and in, you know, so I'm constantly on the lookout for, okay, so what are some best practices and how does one reach out? And, and I think that your, so what, what you just shared really talks to that. Um, Javad, I really want to, with your permission, devil's advocate that a little bit, if that's okay with you. Yeah, perfect, good. Okay, so here goes. Now, the, what you spoke of was in 2007, right? Mm -hmm. And in 2007, for example, if I set up a blog, I'm just going mm -hmm. to a separate platform, then yeah. there was novelty in it. There were, you know, fewer bloggers out there, fewer, you, you know, not as many niches that were explored. So I could find my specialized niche. And, you know, if I put in the hours, if I put in the uh, hard work, uh, and if I put in a year, year and a half uh, into my blog, then I would get a good following and then it would work out well. Now, fast forward that, you know, uh, and it's been what, 2010 to 17, that's 10 years and now it's about 14, 15 years later, you know, whew, I mean, the internet's a crazy place to be today. It's, it's a very different place to be today. And whether it is, uh, being in center of a network, like you're saying. So I know a lot of people, there are, there are spinning off networks, like with, let's say, a WhatsApp network, something as simple as that, to, let's say, uh, a more complex get people together network. Uh, I know people setting up blogs, uh, you know, really pushing out on LinkedIn, really being a content producer on Facebook and Insta and so on and so forth. So but that real estate is just taken, 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 you know? So, and today, if I go and try and follow podcasts, um, it takes me a lot of effort to really, really sift through um, who's really good at it. And even then when I do that, and when I've spent that time doing that, I, I still miss out uh, on a lot, of, a, a lot of people. So to give you an example, I've been, I've been uh, listening to a lot of interviews and stuff, you know, also to better my podcast. Um, and I completely missed this guy, Jordan Peterson. And you know, just yesterday, I was looking at the kind of content on his show. Amazing stuff. Yeah, that's that's an education by itself. If you just look at his videos, True. he's got a crazy book list. So even somebody, my point is, even somebody who's so out there, like a Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. I 
completely missed. So what, so, you know, how does what you're saying work in a context of today where there is just this crazy deluge of information out there in whatever format, podcast, video, conferences, WhatsApp, how does one network stand out? So um, I think with uh, with what's happened with all the digital uh, technology as well as the various platforms that have been uh, that have come over since, I think one of the key things um, that I have noticed, uh, and this is something which uh, was always important, but one of the key things you'll also know this because you you run the whole podcast uh, itself, uh, is consistency. Now that was true even at that time when there were a few sort of people. Uh, it's even true right now. So there are only maybe a small percentage of people who are consistent with what they're doing, whether it's writing a blog, whether it's having a podcast, putting out videos on, on, a, on a video log or, or any other. But that is just one part of it because anybody can actually uh, today create content mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes the content that may be relevant. right? But what is needed today is to have some sort of a digital strategy that brings all of it together. What do you now, mean by digital strategy? Yeah. Yep, so, and sorry if I may interrupt. So consistency, I get that. Uh, but, you know, let's say numbers. So let's say there were a thousand bloggers, many more. Right. Let's say a thousand bloggers way back in 2007. And out of the thousand, let's say there were, okay, 10 consistent people that right. made it right. big. Today made it big. Um, Maria Popova and her brain picking. Yeah. But as time has gone, even the number of consistent players has, yeah. you know, crazily mushroomed. So True. consistency meant let's say in 2007, uh, you, you know, nine months, one year into it, I start seeing results because consistency today um, means, you know, two years, perhaps, I don't know. And so my, my, my question is, yeah, I get it. So consistency, certainly, how does one stay motivated? Uh, you know, how do you m- maximize your bang for your buck uh, when, when it comes to consistency? And I think I just want to quickly get the second question out saying, mm-hmm. what is this? you know, digital strategy therefore mean it gets thrown around a lot. And I'm, you know, I'm asking this because you've seen this, not just from a person preaching this saying, Hey, digital strategy and stuff, but actually living it and doing it. So I'm sure you could talk to that. uh, I completely agree with you. The number of consistent uh, people who may be putting stuff out there is is definitely on the higher side today. So there are a lot more people who have uh, gone out there. But I think what I mean by uh, being able to kind of put a strategy together is today um, attention spans are so small and we are so used to so many different platforms. It it makes sense for us to be able to focus on the kind of group that you want to actually address. Who do you want to actually reach out? What's the kind of content uh, that you want to actually put up? And you, will, uh, my own view is that you know uh, I won't at least I won't be consistent with content that I'm putting out if I'm not passionate about it, right? So if it is, if it means that, you know, I'm putting in a lot of work to try and gather something together, which I know for the moment may be relevant in the, in the environmental context of how things are moving either in my country or maybe across the world, but it may not be something that maybe um, I'm, I may not be passionate about. So that consistency at some point will go. Mm-hmm. But if you pick something which you, you actually are passionate about, consistency usually stays. But then it has to also come together as part of an overall ecosystem that you want to target, right? So uh, in that ecosystem could be uh, platforms where your listeners are, where your viewers are, or the kind of audiences that you want to reach out. Mm -hmm. It's possible that, you know, you mentioned, but Peterson, it's possible that, you know, somewhere we may have not been a target audience for him. It's possible. I don't know what strategy he's operating on, right? But as part of that strategy, being able to choose what kind of platforms, where do you want your message to go out, who are the people that you are looking at. And then obviously the analytics of it will, will keep sharing back with you how you're doing on it. And then you make those incremental uh, changes to be able to kind of address that whole market uh, that you're trying to get to. And it's a slow process. There isn't like one channel or one mechanism to be able to kind of get there. Um, people write books. People have their own blog alongside the book. Sometimes they have a website which is dedicated to that particular topic. They may be on um, virtual conferences or virtual webinars, putting that same information out, right? So if you see the whole ecosystem at the end of it, what they've created around maybe a topic that they're passionate about, 
Uh, it could be addressing a lot of different platforms, but eventually reaching out to people who have an interest in the topic. Yeah. And, you know, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, was, so this guy is on every platform, man. And I, and I think that's, so you go to Twitter, he's there. You go to, and he tells you how to do it. Uh, yeah. You go to Instagram, he's there. You go to any, any kind of a platform, he's just there, 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 you know. He's cracked it on Twitter. Imagine a crazy place like Twitter, he's cracked it over there. Yeah, so um, the, just to give you a, um, from a strategy perspective uh, and what kind of content you want to put out, I know of uh, a few people when you go on Insta, yeah. um, a lot of people think about Insta as, as you know, having pictures of yourself in different places or different time period doing different things. Yeah. But I know of a person who, uh, who actually uses Insta and the pictures that he actually, are all metaphors. Right? Okay. And it's essentially some moment that he's captured in his actual life, in his actual experience. But then there is a message around that, uh, that visual, mm -hmm. right? And it's a deep message sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the choice that we make about how we want to use the platform, do we want to use the platform to be able to just share about ourselves, about our thinking or, or about something, some aspect of life. So that is also a choice that also becomes part of your strategy itself. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you say is a couple of, a few pieces. So, and I've been taking notes as you've been speaking. Yeah. So, so one is um, a, a much deeper understanding of analytics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's YouTube or whatever, I, I, I think that's no longer exotic. You have to do it, right? Yeah. And that's where you want to, that's a kind of a Pareto where you'd want to put in your effort. So I, th I think that's the first one. Consistency, of course, mm -hmm. uh, get, get some good basic stuff in know your audience. Mm -hmm. um, but then you'd also spoke of something like, you know, visual, personal storytelling. You know, I'm just pulling these three words out of this Instagram and story. The that thing is something that you're passionate about. There is a consistency. Some people can do it or maybe hire or engage agencies to do it for you. Yeah. But uh, and if you're doing it, then it becomes an effort after some time if you're not yeah. passionate about it. Absolutely. So, and you know, underlying over there, being clear about what you want to do and you're going to get time only if you're able to say no to a whole lot of things. Um, I think that's that's the piece. Now, if I if I were to just throw you a hypothetical case and study and say, hey, uh, you know what, Jawad, uh, there's this facilitator out there just about start. It's 2021, just about you know starting her or his organization doesn't even know, do I do organization? Do I do individual freelancer? Mm -hmm. Wants to set up his or her um, digital strategy. So, mm -hmm. you know, what are some advice you can give them? Let's say a nine month kind of advice. Do this, do this and do this. Three point, four point advice, something people, may not be a complete piece, but something people can, you know, take, run with. You can lean into your experience from and just, you know, chip away at it. So, um, as I said, um, uh, the assumption is that facilitation is what your passion is, yeah. right? And that's really what you want to build it that's around. That's the assumption, yes. Um, and so, my, my first uh, piece of advice would perhaps be to be part of some kind of a, a, a network or an organization. And the reason why I say that is because um, uh, what you're passionate about, there's also a lot of learning. It's not that you you basically stop learning. And uh, especially in, in facilitation, um, what we see is that um, if you are young starting off in this area, mm -hmm. right, you need the credibility of maybe a network mm -hmm. to be part of your own credibility. It adds to your credibility. Mm -hmm. So let's say if, if I have my profile going on and I, I talk about being a member of the International Association of Facilitators, mm -hmm. which I did because I started in when I was about 24, 25 years old uh, in this area. So I needed that credibility of the association mm -hmm. uh, because I was standing up in front of, um, you know, vice presidents, HR, uh, heads of l &D. So somewhere, um, while the most senior you are, the assumption that, I mean, the experience that I've had is um, people actually are much, much more willing to support and help you uh, in the room. Um, but the credibility kind of adds. Or else many times profiles, your profile gets rejected by someone in the organization because they don't see you as, as being credible. So being part of a network is definitely one because it adds to the learning. It also adds to your credibility. Right? Yeah. So one, the first leg of your strategy, sorry, I'm just quickly capturing that is build your credibility, go mm. out there, build, build, build. And yeah. 
<coughs> sorry, one of the ways of doing that is go be part of a network. If not at the center, at least a part of it. And then can yeah. maybe go to the then, center. Um, if there's an opportunity where you can get to the center, go ahead. Whether it's right. uh, maybe being part of an initiative, an intervention, right. something that is being done uh, to maybe support an NGO or maybe uh, some kind of, um, you can drive many things within a, a network. If you put your hand up, because many um, of these networks sometimes are voluntary. So, so what kind of a network are you saying? Are you saying like like you were part of an international uh, facilitator network? Are you saying any kind of network, a facilitation net, network of facilitators per se, or just any kind of network? So, so um, it will be good for you to be part of uh, the, the subject area that you are in, okay. uh, to be part of the network. I mean, that's the, that's the best. But you can also be a, a broader part of a network. So let's say I was part of many HR networks too, mm. right? From NHRD to I used to attend the conferences at IHRD, and so on. So there were a lot of different um, networks that I could easily be part of um, at a broader level. But yes, the, if you want to learn about your subject, then it's always better to be uh, specifically part of uh, your your right. subject. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. But when you say network, what do you mean? Do you mean a WhatsApp group? Do you mean conferences where people meet up? Do you mean something on Insta? What do you mean by network? Um, almost all of it uh, today, because um, uh, a lot of it is on the digital side. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to to be part of uh, the activity that happens on the digital side is important. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things can be shared very quickly. Uh, experiences. Sometimes it could just be part of a WhatsApp group that the network may have started, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but you could ask questions, you can learn from others, you can also uh, share information that you may have. But at the same time, also being part of the physical um, network's uh, activities also gives you more visibility because um, the virtual persona is great, but I think there's a very different um, networking or opportunity to know each other when you're actually in person. Absolutely. So and, and the word that comes to my mind is like a portfolio of networks, maybe one, two, three, but some portfolio and it's going to require time you're going to you're going to have to put in hard work because it doesn't yeah, you have to kind of uh, give it the time and the yeah. assumption is that if you're somebody who's starting out mm -hmm. uh, it's always better that way especially if you're someone who is um, not very out there uh, you know and you don't think that you must splash yourself all over mm -hmm. right but the uh, so there's a bit of a dichotomy in being part of a network where you're maybe an introvert but I think the opportunities that you will get to be part of initiatives and interventions at the center may, that the yeah. network may be running, I think that's Absolutely. always that. That's great. What else? So a couple of other points. So network is one. Network is one. You need to also be able to create your own brand then, right? So what is it that you stand for? So sometimes it could just mean, so in coaching, we say, uh, you know, I only coach habits or I am a spiritual coach or I'm an executive coach. Right. So there are, there are these various areas that you go off into. So similarly in facilitation also, you have a lot of opportunity to explore, um, you know, facilitation in specific areas. Like you could be only in strategy facilitation, right? Mm -hmm. Or you could be in, uh, you know, conflict facilitation, yeah. right? And um, there are many times uh, conferences that happen, uh, which bring multiple stakeholders together to come up with ideas, uh, issue, resolve issues. Um, like one conference I had heard of, I wasn't part of, but I had heard of was a conference which was actually thinking on various ways in making um, water um, availability more efficient. Now, the stakeholders there were farmers and people who were agriculturists, the companies who, who actually innovate around products around this, around uh, making water efficient. And of course, you have the governmental agencies that, that make things happen. Now, if you look at it, all these three groups have very th three different agendas completely, mm. right? But the job of a facilitator there is to be able to see how you can bring people closer, mm. despite the conflicts that may exist in each other's visions, each other's uh, you know goals and objectives. Right? Go out there and it won't happen in a day. That's what it I'm won't saying. happen in a day. There has sure. to be some amount of divergent thinking. Go and yes. paste you know, uh, whether it's NLP, whether it's whatever, some other different kind, yeah. but but what I hear, hypnotherapy, I, I, I hear there is a rise of a lot of demand in hypnotherapy, um, uh, but slowly and surely find your niche. It is important to, uh, to be known, not, you know, just do a whole lot of things, but the model that you're talking about is uh, find your niche, go after yeah. that niche. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and what you said earlier probably feeds into this point. So if you're part of a network, it, 
you know, just makes it a little easier to find your niche. I, th I think. Of course, easy. with experience and time, you will um, you'll realize what you're comfortable with and what areas you you don't work with. Absolutely, great. And what last piece from a strategy? Yeah. So apart from being part of the physical uh, system as well as taking part, I think it's really important um, because all of these avenues uh, are basically for you to be able to receive uh, yeah. from there. The opportunity, I think, is when you can actually start giving, you put yourself out there a lot more. So um, part of networking is not just about being able to kind of get from, from others, um, but also about what you can do. Now, what you can do could be at a very, um, at a minimal level, go back to your school, go back to your college, talk to your um, uh, management there and say, I can do something if, if there's an aspect that the teachers need help in. I can facilitate those conversations. I can facilitate conversations for students, right? Make their learning a little bit more engaging. And um, I think that is perhaps the more rewarding, more satisfying feeling you will you'll probably be left with. But that it doesn't just have to be there or, or only necessarily to that kind of a, a system only, but you can offer this service to uh, NGOs um, mm. who, are, who are working in, uh, in different places to make social changes and impact possible, right? So um, once you have, once you've learned a certain skill, once you've kind of received, um, you know, the opportunity for you to give back in many ways is always there. It's, it's, it's only a limitation is only how much you can actually think about it and yeah. how much time you have to give. So, you know, there's an interesting quote I came across a while back, which said, yeah, I'm, I'm digressing a little over here, but uh, it's, it, he was, it was by Seth Godin. And he was talking about, it was an interview with Tim Ferriss and Seth Godin, and he was talking about a depression, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he, he, made, he, he made a really nice statement saying, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember the exact piece, but approximately said something like this. Uh, you may not have someone who loves you, right? It's quite mm. possible. But you will always have someone who needs you, right? Mm. So, you know, yeah. I, as you were talking, that just, you know, popped into my head and say, go find who needs you and then go do mm. and then go give. And as, you know, a, a, you know, a while back, I don't want to make this about myself, but a while back, very quickly, uh, in one of the workshops, there was a topic I was running saying the rules of selfish. Right, mm -hmm. we're all selfish people. You can't no, no getting around that unless you know you put a crazy amount of work to let that go. But we're all selfish people. Almost ninety nine point nine nine percent of the planet is. So, but there are rules to being selfish, and the first rule of being selfish is if you want to get something, if you want to get something, you first got to give. You first got to give. So, Good. you know, it's like the if you Venn diagram selfless and selfish, it's 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 where the circles meet, and I, I think that's a good space to operate out of. Uh, Jaldini's whole thing on reciprocity and creating give. And, you know, Jawad, I think you've, you've outlined it much better than a lot of books have put this together, uh, saying, one, be part of, I hope I remember this now, uh, be part of a network as soon as you can. Just go yeah. be part of a network. Um, the second one is, how can I give? That's actually the, 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 the third piece and yeah and get to be known for something yeah, yeah. Uh, create your niche that was a second so be part of a network get to be known for something it's it's a journey it's going to take time and but what's it's something that we can start with our responsible action what is my little responsible action i may not be able to give strategies to a yeah. fortune 500 ceo but what can i do at my uh, at my space how can i get those gifts and then the universe is just going to give it back to you and you know, a little bit of trust in there so just to get a little philosophical and digress over there but um in in closing jawad is there a message you'd like to leave our fellow facilitators designers trainers with before we leave yeah so um i've, I've always kind of um, believed this that uh, you are a facilitator in life so it doesn't matter whether you take on the role as a professional or not but facilitation is something we've done all our lives, uh, whether it is deciding on what to eat at a restaurant um, to, uh, you know, when, a, when you have a kid who's throwing a tantrum um, to get something. So it's a life skill. And this life skill, uh, you can apply it anywhere you want, uh, in any circumstance, any situation, 
your apartments association uh, conflicts or, or discussions, or it could be uh, in a conversation that may be happening at home. Um, so it's a skill that is useful to build uh, and have uh, and grow. Um, and so I would, I would really encourage people to kind of think about it and uh, um, see if that's a skill that you want to acquire. And what I also hear you saying is if, if you're really if you're really committed to the skill, it will change you as a human being, almost oh, yeah. like no other job, almost like no other job, yeah, for the better, for the better. Yeah. Jawad, it's been, it's been a true pleasure speaking to you. Um, yeah, my pleasure too. a great time. I've learned a lot as I speak to you and uh, looking forward to you being on the show sometime down the line. Yeah, happy to be back. Thanks, Jawad.